Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to this week's Fuse Meet session. I hope you're all doing well out there in the cryptoverse. You're here with me today, Ian Kane, and in this session, we'll be chatting with Mike Reavy from Buller Network. Buller Network is a versatile Web3 accounting protocol. It offers tools for fast, easy, secure crypto commerce. And basically, the Web3 protocol allows users to send invoices, pay remittance, and manage all their business and personal accounts on chain. In the future, the protocol opens the way for on chain funding of credit as well. So now that Buller has launched on Fuse, developers and builders can tap into their technology stack to enhance their own projects. So, Mike, how are you doing today? You okay? You good? <laughs> Very good, Ian. You got me up a little bit early uh, over here in Denver. So if, if, uh, if a kid walks <laughs> by or something, you know, just know it's the normal uh, early morning routine here. I got it. I got it. Same thing happens on my side, Mike. All good. It actually lets people know that we're real and we're not just some robots hanging out somewhere. So I think it's kind of cool when that happens. So as I say, we've got Mike here with us today. So let me just run through a few bits of admin and then we'll jump straight in. So for those of you who don't already know, maybe this is the first time you've tuned into a Fuse Meet session. Fuse Network is a unique blockchain that aims to bridge the gap between crypto and the real world. Our blockchain stack alongside our new charge product is tailored to help small to medium sized businesses embrace web three crypto payments, as well as reducing their cost of sales, helps them to build out a better customer reward and loyalty system. And all with like really minimal knowledge of smart contracts and coding, which is really the key to what's happening right now. So one of the critical building blocks of inter, uh, interoperability for commerce is tokenizing invoices. In human language, what we're talking about here is having an invoice minted as an NFT as it provides an immutable document of ownership for commerce, resulting in a one source of truth to check the credit worthiness of its parties. So this allows invoice financing and factoring use cases for large corporations, as well as small and medium businesses as well. So with all that in mind, it's pretty complicated and that's why we're here today to unpack it all. So we've got Mike from Buller Network, as I said, and we're gonna jump in and we're gonna talk all about Buller, what it's about, how you come up with this idea. But from the beginning, Mike, I want to know a little bit about yourself. I want to know about where did you come from? Which, what's your background in work-wise? How have you got involved in blockchain? And how has that kind of led you to, found, uh, to be the founder of Buller Network? All right, Ian, thanks for that introduction. That was, that was great. Um, on me, I'm, I'm a pretty old person. So I, I got a degree in computer science and linguistics in 19, I think 85. And mm -hmm have been programming ever since. Uh, my biggest jobs in the beginning was just doing um, accounting software or modifications for accounting software. So that's kind of where I learned about accounting. But then I got a job on Wall Street. I was a quant, uh, you know, programmer, trader guy. I was a convertible bond trader, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, eventually I was in a hedge fund. I ran a hedge fund for a while, a very small one. And then I had uh, exposure to Lehman Brothers because I worked at Lehman Brothers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, it became clear to me that, uh, you know, banking is quite a political kind of thing. Money is pretty political. I think people are understanding that more and more now. Yeah, sure, and yeah. uh, so after Lehman, what happened was I, I lost my job where I sold actually the, the hedge fund and I moved back into programming. I got back out my programming box. I discovered Bitcoin in, let's wow. see, this was 2011, I think. Wow. And uh, yeah, so I started, I bought a little Bitcoin. I got into the Golang stuff, but it's very difficult to program anything, uh, you know, big in Bitcoin. Sure. And everybody kept talking about programmable money, programmable money, but I, couldn't, <laughs> yeah. I only saw Bitcoin as, it's really just the payment you know, send me some Bitcoin. Okay, thank you. And then Solidity came out and that really changed things. And I started programming a lot of stuff, a lot of, you know, just weird, dumb ideas. Yeah. Uh, long story short, I, I came back. This was when I was in Switzerland. I came back to the US, I uh, shared an office with another ex-quant guy and he kept bugging, I kept bugging him, hey, how do I get stuff on this Azure server? I wanted to- oh, yeah you know, uh, get stuff to work. And he was, what are you doing? And I was, well, this is Solidity. Uh, it's pretty cool. This is all Web3, asynchronous. And so that's my head dev now. And that's how, that's my- All right, dev. nice. So you kind of onboarded him, like he just was looking over yes. your shoulder and now he's part yeah. of the team. That's yeah, now he's full, full Monty 
solidity. I mean, before he was, wow. you know, all Web Two stuff. Wow, that's that's a really cool journey, Mike. Even that, just that little fraction of it there. I'm sure there's plenty more inside that as well. But Wall Street trader. So exposure to Lehman Brothers, not what you quite expected, gave you a bit of a sour <laughs> taste, and then led you to. So I'm guessing that's how you've you've come to to sort of found Buller, right? That that kind of negative sort yeah. of thing that happened there, yeah. Yeah, I want people to um, own their property. Frankly, you know, the externalities of of cryptocurrency are are such that you know political uh, people choosing winners and losers can't really happen so easily. And uh, back to Fuse, I want people to use more and more crypto because even if you're using USDC, and I know that's a centralized stable token, it's still on chain. It's some, some, something that people can't easily take away from you. And, uh, you know, you're, you're left to your own devices. I think that's, that's a good thing. So it's about empowering people and putting that power back into people's hands, giving them their finances and giving them that ability to make their own choices and have a little bit more security with their finance as well, right? I guess. It's, yeah, uh, and uh, sadly, with it comes a lot of responsibility. And I think that's part of the, we'll, we'll talk about it later, the adoption yeah. Yeah. is is difficult, but you know. A very big part of this whole journey, I think exactly my what you're saying about adoption and onboarding and responsibility. There's a strong argument right now to say, you know, that we're all crying to have responsibility, but is the human race actually ready for that responsibility, <laughs> given that they've had their hand held so firmly for so many years? It's kind of our mission, isn't it, to try to change those feelings. But all right. That's pretty cool. So you've come from a situation whereby something negative that you saw has led you into a positive spin. I think that's very cool. But um, one of the things that really piqued my interest, because I like to do a bit of research before I sit down with you guys, and um, the word buller came up in my read. I thought I'd heard it before somewhere else in a documentary I watched a long time ago. So I started Googling <laughs> and I basically found out I'm going to flash up a little picture because it's an interesting thing. So, and I'll, but I'll let you talk about it, Mike. So this is what I found. It looks a bit like a, a brain <laughs> of some kind. <laughs> and then I found this other thing, which looks like a giant corn on the cob, and there's a little piece missing, and I don't think that's intentional. But what I found out that basically, buller means something to do with a very old school. And when I say old school, I'm talking many thousands of years ago, but it's like an NFT, but it was made of concrete. So Mike, you're the expert here. Where did you get your brand name from and why is it so kind of important here in what we're talking about? I, well, I, where I got it was my, my mom is a crazy artist and she always had art books lying around. And one of my favorite was Sumerian art. And in it is stuff like, like these Bulla things. And I always found them really interesting and, and you know, mysterious. And then I was trying to express what, um, what this protocol does to somebody and and it hit me like, oh my God, this is, they were doing it a long time ago. What you just flashed was an NFT, more or less. That's and the it, idea, right? yeah, it is. The, the idea, the little, the little stones on the bottom, those mm -hmm. are probably like two cow and six sheep. And what would happen is you, you could go to a market with a specimen and people would say, okay, I want to buy six or eight. You didn't want to bring the whole herd into town because you, you couldn't. So oh, what you did was you collected a bunch of tokens for animals or, or wheat or whatever it was, and then you took it to the, um, the, the I want to say Schreib, the, uh, the, the, the uh, person who, who uh, register, and you, sure. would like make a a clay, almost, right? like... you would make a clay pouch and you would sign it and everything, uh, and, and then they would burn it so you could take that clay pouch later and collect your, your goods because it was signed by you. Wow. And if, if you think about um, blockchain, it's all about signature yep. and really less about, you know, I know peer to peer. I know, uh, you know, all the the uh, elliptical, you know, cryptography. It's all about that as well. But yep. at its base, it's about signature. And as long as you can verify somebody's signature, then that's your stamp. That's your bulla. And it's uh, they were papal bulls as well. I don't, you know, remember your you're part English, right? The Henry VIII was excommunicated probably with a papal bull, you know, that was stamped on a document somewhere and sent to him. Yeah. So that's what a bulla is. It's a signature. It was super interesting because, yeah, straight away, I was like, as you've explained, I was like, well, there's your ledger. 
and there's your NFT. And I was like, <laughs> so what we've been saying, we're blazing a trail through technology. Well, they've been doing it for thousands of years, Mike. We're just piggybacking on their original yeah, tech, they right? Are. Yes, they are. <laughs> so I wanted to get into that because I found it really fascinating. And it, it's kind of like sometimes brand names are a little bit abstract, but in your case, absolutely not. It's not abstract. So so we kind of now know that the, where the, the idea comes from. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, what is Buller Network? What do you guys do? Tell us about your, your service and your protocol. Well, like, like Ebola of old, the network, the reason we called it a network is, is we have the intention to uh, expand the protocol into more and more front end kind of uh, applications. So the first one is Bola Banker and that's just invoicing payroll. That's for a solopreneur or a Dow tooling or you okay. know a, a smaller company. But then we have an, uh, the intention and it might all end up on Bola Banker anyway, but the intention was to have uh, something we call friend lend, which is just making IOUs, UOMEs to for small loans, and that would be like on Bulla, Bulla Lend, something like that. And then we were thinking about, uh, well, back to Bulla Bankers and purchasing orders. So the idea is it's a network where if you use the protocol, it will automatically wind up into the, the front end that we have. Okay, so for example, yeah, anybody who uh, wants to take some of our code and write, you know, something new and then attach it, you will see it on the front end that's created. You can't, you can't create these days a protocol and say, that's it, you know, I'm done. done. You, need a, you need a front end to demonstrate what it can do and, and uh, allow people to get access to it and to understand it. So that's, that's what Network is and Bullet Banker is really our first app. Hope to okay. do Friendland later and a few others. Nice. So, so Buller Banker is kind of the, as you say, for small to maybe for kind of entrepreneurs, quite small businesses to do their personal invoicing, to do their accounts fundamentally. And then yeah. you've got the larger. So that's kind of like the showcase, isn't it, of your technology, right? That's what people are able to do. But the bigger yes. picture is the B2B play, right? Where you're trying to the developers plug into your stack and can then offer this as a service through their whatever, however it complements their service as well, right? But one of the, the premises of the whole thing is using non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and using them as invoices, right? So what is an NFT invoice? Because people know about million dollar monkey faces and they probably know about crypto art, but they don't know about these invoices. So tell us about this, Mike. How does this work? Okay, this is interesting because I, we NFT'd it way before Bored Apes, you know. Uh, and You were the OG. You guys were the well, OG. <laughs> I should have bought a board ape. I didn't. <laughs> but, you know, it was the we idea is, yeah, the idea is you want to put something, you want to put something like this in a standard form that everybody then can access and see. So, I mean, yeah. I could show you later, but like if you open a Gnosis safe and somebody has sent you an invoice from Bulla, there's a there's an area you can see your assets, so you can see your die and your Ethereum, whatever. And then there's an NFT tab. You click on the NFT tab, and you see a little Bulla claim. Uh, oh, you know, and you can you can open that then and go to the app. That's the idea. That's why we use the NFT because we wanted to put it in a standard format. Uh, what it is though is, and what's cool about an NFT is you can add metadata. The simplest form of an NFT invoice is is it's a, and I always draw a picture. It's an IOU on the top and it's a U, UO me, uh, UO me on the bottom. Okay. Right. Yep. Because it, the, what's cool about it is it's a, it's, it's shared by both parties. Yep. And depending on the context, that determines whether you're a creditor or a debtor. Okay. And, okay. and then because the amount is different, it's non fungible. It's really your, it's your business between you and your counterparty. No, nobody else's. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it non-fungible, even though we can talk about, you know, why that's useful later for factoring, funding, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. That's something we'll get into later. Okay, so it's a representation of an invoice, fundamentally, of um, that it's then immutable over time because you've got two parties with, it, with the access to this. Okay, so it makes good sense there. Can you give us an example in the real world, an example of how an, an, an NFT invoice and, and how that would kind of work in the in the real world. Well, we have one one person who has used it quite a bit. They mint um, tokens to represent people planting trees. 
and these trees can then these nft trees can be used in games so there's a real world kind of gaming example what they wanted to do was mint all of those uh nft tree things at one time but bill uh people separately so they invoiced all these people uh to to pay for the trees and once they had all the money then they did the bigger mint of the uh. nft so and and then they had a record also of every every person saying yes you, you know i i agree that um this company has created an invoice to buy this other nft and you have the signature on both sides so you know that that that's a that's a a doubly signed transaction it's a confirmed transaction uh, so yeah, that know, makes they, sense. and yeah. they use it later than to give people rewards and things like that so it's just easier for you to manage uh your rewards and you know your customers too later well this is this is the thing i was going to ask you about in terms of the the users side of things and managing customers and giving rewards and building loyalty how does a system like this how can it assist small businesses and sort of entrepreneurs and the bigger businesses to build more kind of two-way communication between themselves and the client over time is there reward mechanisms that can be included here and things like that how does it work with that i right now there are no reward mechanisms but i think they're easily added the the you got to get to stage one first mm -hmm. what i like about it is and so many people talk about this and some of my competitors once you agree to pay an invoice in an NFT, then the two addresses there are, are immutable. Yep. So you know that that transaction occurred and that everybody's happy with it. I mean, maybe it was a mistake, but let's assume yeah. that both parties know what they're doing. Once you have that, that data, then it's easy for you to extrapolate uh, uh, c customers. You know, people talk about MFA, like, um, you know, your, um, your, your, your list of vendors that you need to know to do business. This builds it on its own, really, you know, from the beginning. You can also add a smart contract that has the MFA, you know, list of your vendors in it. But once you start using Bulla, and once you see the, the same address is being used in NFTs, then you can build more and more trust between your, your counterparties. And it's a self self-fulfilling kind of thing. It's a decentralized way to build trust. It's, yeah. it's yeah. web three, it's everything that, you know, that that people have to get their head around you know coming from web two it's so different right well that's it right and I, and I think we touched on that at the beginning as well and we should I think we should get into that as well and talking about how web two we talk about web two payments and kind of more precisely what are the missing features in kind of web two accounting software how can you fill those gaps in a web3 system or maybe the better question is why is the web3 system more advanced or efficient than the old web2 how can yeah, you yeah i can i can take a stab at that right now yeah a lot of companies are server to uh transaction yeah right so they have a server and they'll have a couple of wallets in there in their database mm -hmm. and then they'll do a, a mass uh, a group of transactions that will then land in all these wallets that are specified in the server. That's web two. So you, you still have off chain, yeah. a database of, you know, addresses. And I, I think ultimately people will understand that, well, I don't want to trust, you know, do I trust that server? Of course, generally you, you probably, you know, you can, you can't, you know what I mean? There's there, there, that's the whole, if, if we can, bridge that gap over to web three where you're using like i was saying nfts where you have multiple signatures verifying uh who what where you know what address and you add a few more layers of smart contracts to manage these things it becomes decentralized and other people everybody can verify what's going on and it, particularly i mean the the other uh, uh company that uses us is is a dao or a mm -hmm. quasi quasi dao and for them, transparency is very important. Yeah. Right. So in in our little system, it's not. I haven't tried it yet on Fuse. I don't know if there's a Gnosis safe on Fuse, but there's a. Even if you have an address for a DAO right now, you mm -hmm. can plug it into the dashboard, the Bullet Banker dashboard. Pretend you're attaching like a signatory to that uh, DAO. Mm -hmm. It won't let you do any transactions, but it will show you all of the, the transactions, at least the bullet ones in there. So you can see 
oh, you know, so-and-so paid, you know, this invoice or there was a remittance made, et cetera. We're going to add uh, some really cool feature I'm working on is a kind of a purchase order, you know, like the world works, the world works kind of backwards. You yeah. know, people will go to a website and say, I want X and that's a purchase order. And then, yeah. then, then you'll get an invoice, right? Yeah. I started with the invoice and I realized I need the purchase order too. The same idea would be true for a DAO. Let's say you want to do a proposal. Mm -hmm. um, you put a proposal in as a uh, future payable and that's tokenized. Yeah. And then either it gets approved or rejected. And everybody, what's nice about it is everybody who has the address for the, for the Gnosis Safe can see these proposals because what, well, our, I didn't mention our invoice NFT has a hash, it has a link to a hash. Uh, ah, so you can just click through and see what that's linked to and look at the block and what's happening. Yes, yes. Nice. So you have you have not only the metadata like I owe you, you owe me on a chain for an amount, but you have a hash that goes to a document on IPFS. You can change that to instead of, you know, being I owe you, you owe me, it, it's really uh, I approve, I, I don't approve, and a proposal that then, once it gets approved, becomes a payable um, uh, NFT itself. So... It's a reversed yeah. NFT, and you, you know what I mean. It's a little, little weird, yeah, but is. I think it's the way it works. I never thought of it like that, but now that you've said it, it makes absolutely perfect sense that you. I agree with the way you approached it at the beginning, though. That would logically kind of be the way I would look at it as well. I mean, just thinking about the transparency issue here as well, and we talk, we're talking about DAOs, and I completely agree with you that the in a DAO formation, that the transparency is vital, right? So I'm going to throw a bit of a controversial question, and I'm sure it's a topic you're quite familiar with. In traditional systems, there are certain circumstances where business needs to protect certain things. If they're tendering, for example, for or they're pitching or for, for a job, they there are certain cases where they need to keep that information private, correct? So in that case, they can use a private blockchain and they can do it in that way. But I guess the question is, if we are trying to sort of change the way that things are done, and you said that when you were at Lehman, you saw these kind of bad things, do you think we can bring this type of system into the mainstream? Or do you think we've got a lot of blockers to kind of shift away before we can get to that? Uh, does it make sense what I'm saying, Mike? Do you know what I yes. mean? Like, yeah. Yes, people's need for security is and, and privacy. This is all, all what we're talking about too, in a mm. weird way blockchain is about privacy too. I mean, it's about, uh, well, control of your, your assets and, you know, but, but I, I do think not all things belong on the blockchain. Uh, you know, if you're doing a negotiation, of course, that's top secret, right? I'm not gonna, I don't want, like, I, I just sold a building the other day. I don't want my three or four bidders colluding. Right, exactly. like, oh, you get you two buy this one, and we'll buy that other one that we're arguing about. That's exactly. that's that that doesn't change. What does change, though, about DAOs or or companies to me is just debt. It's if okay. you think about Bulla, Bulla is really, and I know everybody bashes fiat, but it's it's a fiat system. So, <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, right now uh, Janet Yellen signs dollar bills, right? I mean, with a with a stamp, with a bulla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. And you can do the same with any uh, currency using bulla. And what you're doing is you're creating an IOU and a you owe me a, a dead instrument. And what frustrates me and Lehman Brothers is a great example, and then uh, Voyager, Celsius, all these companies have. Yeah debt that goes off chain that you can't see. I think that's different. I think if you're at an exchange, if you're at, uh, you know, you're relying on a banking system, you should know and be able to see how much debt is really, you, um, you know, out there and how much hy hypothecation has occurred. And to me, that's the bigger nut. The other stuff, if, if it needs to be private, private blockchain, you can hash it, maybe zero knowledge. I, I sure. don't know enough about ZK yet. I think there are solutions for that as well, but that to me is the smaller part and you shouldn't be putting really sensitive stuff on IPFS, for example, you know, if yeah. you don't want people to see your invoicing, then maybe you don't put it, you don't use the link. Or if you do use the link, it's a link to a hash that then has to go to a server that is off chain. You know, there are, there are solutions to all of them. 
But the, the bigger thing, Ian, to me is just, you know, debt, hypothecation, rehypothecation. Yeah. We've yeah. gone through, how many cycles do we have to go through? You know, where, right? People are. <laughs> Hopefully this was the last one, right? If it, 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 it does feel a little bit like people are a bit fed up of those cycles and that there's time yeah. to make a change, right? That we can't just I, continue I in so. everlasting, well, exactly. And you've experienced it firsthand as well, Mike, where you've kind of been inside the belly of the beast a little bit, right? So you've seen oh. the way that <laughs> your face yeah. when I said it instantly. Right? Yeah, I mean, I remember too, Ian, you know, prime brokerage, right? The, the lending yeah. and hypothecation is always very important to find out if the 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 object has been already lent out to somebody else, are you sure? Are you sure about your borrow? And every day they would come up, you know, I was a trader, so they'd be like, Mike, do you have, do you really have the borrow? Did you confirm? And so, well, I'll call them again. Oh, I mean, that's right. the, the problem with, with Celsius and Voyager was it became this giant circle that, you know, virtuous at first and then uh, blowing up at the end. And I, I want to break that, I think, with things like friend lend, with um, on-chain, you know, just basic peer-to-peer -peer lending. You yeah. can build, rebuild a, 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 a nice credit system that's not going to, I mean, sure, it will have some cycles, but it's not going to blow up so fantastically. No, I think... I just never thought about it in the way that you've just described it, Mike, in terms of focusing in on the debt side of things. And actually now that just puts to bed what I'm talking about. Because, But do you think that if we focus in on the debt side of things, that's kind of the general public that have a, the company should have an obligation to show this then. Like Celsius should have had an obligation to display their Absolutely. debt levels, right? So that pe users and consumers could make educated decisions. Do you think we'll get to a point where the... So the first question I asked was, will corporations decide to use your system? Now we're here, I'm thinking they'll almost be forced to use it from the consumer perspective. Do you think I, that's an evolution that might happen? I hope so. I, I think so. I mean, I don't know why I would put money on a on a CFI ever again, or, you know, if I did, maybe 10 grand, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing big. Right. I would want to... And it goes back to, you know, things of the banking system right now, FDIC insured banking, it's, it's the same price for, of insurance for every bank. So they're not even distinguishing themselves with their risk profile. Yeah, you know, that, that sends the wrong message. Wow. Everybody's leveraging, you know, to the same, to the same degree. It all it has this virtuous up cycle and then crash and boom. I, we got to get away from that. Right. And the ways to get away from it are, I believe to, uh, you know, go back to fundamentals. The BOLA protocol is really a very, very basic fundamental uh, protocol. It's really simple. But on top of that, we can build better credit systems. So like, you know, just small loans between you and me, or if I want to uh, finance an invoice, I send you an invoice for a refrigerator. I'm a manufacturer. There's a little click on it. Do you want to finance? Yes, I do. That NFT converts as paid, pay, but then I have a loan payable, loan receivable. Uh, that can come back on my books. All of this is on chain. And, and then I can sell, sell all those. If I'm the manufacturer and I need some working capital, I can sell my loan um, receivable book to somebody else. And even that is on chain. So then you could see, well, the, the uh, you know, short-term finance people for commercial uh, stuff are leveraged, you know, five to one, 10 to one. Maybe it's a, you know, not a good time for me to give them money for their pool for more yeah. lending, right? Yeah, it makes so much sense. It's absolutely logical, really, isn't it? And um, yeah. how can so if you if you imagine that the two systems would have to work side by side to some extent, you know, how can Buller integrate with more kind of traditional systems and maybe like enterprise resource planning and the sort of the accounting functions that are done right now? How can Buller be part of that picture? Is it a fairly straightforward integration, or or can it just replace that? I, I don't think it can replace everything. No, that's there's there's so much code that's been written, you know, over the years. A lot of it very good. I don't think yeah. you want to throw everything away, right? But but you want to try to transition where it makes sense. And uh, Bulla has, of course, a CSV upload, CSV download, so you can you know upload a payroll and send it out. You can upload upload a bunch of invoices and pay them. You can then download them back into your accounting system if, if you want to. I think the, the real um, point is 
cost of capital. If you want to get access to cheaper costs of capital, ultimately a decentralized credit token, like we're talking about, will lead to, to that kind of thing. And if you're one of the first people there, I think you are going to uh, benefit from that. So back to, you know, what I was just talking about, manufacturer or somebody who's doing some kinds of, you know, finance, it's, it strikes me as you want to be there in the, in, and get into that market and, and start to get, gain access from the world. I mean, look at, look at some of these, I know we went through just all this massive speculation, you know, ICO, and then uh, everybody's token, right? Uh, think of the amount of money or capital that's lying around. People want to deploy their capital and you decentralize, you make this transparent. Uh, I think your, your cost of capital goes way down. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a good that point. was just a dumb observation. I'm talking to somebody in um, Kazakhstan, for example. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, that's, that's some hard goods delivery, gas, oil, uh, for them to factor invoicing in Kazakhstan, because it's a little banking cartel, cost them 18%. Now, okay. now you tell me, you know, that's AAA credit. I'd be happy. Can you imagine making 18% on quasi AAA? Of course, Kazakhstan has other political problems, but, but you know what I mean? This is where we're at. I, and particularly in those parts of the world, not, you know, there's nothing too broken in the United States. You know what I mean? It's, it's I get not what you like, mean. The systems are there in place. It's not so tragic as, yeah, like as you highlight there, that 18% is absolutely that's criminal. Really. Yeah, it's, it's criminal. <laughs> it, it is. It. <laughs> I was going to ask you, actually, I mean, it's interesting that we've come to that about the kind of, obviously, this system is one of more increased efficiency and savings for, for users, right? So what kind of, no hard figures or anything, Mike, but we're talking... For example, we know that if people are doing payments using Visa and Stripe and other things, they're losing quite high percentages in their in their transactions. In a system like this, for example, I don't know if we should give an example of maybe doing payroll, for example. Payroll is quite an expensive process for any company to undertake, right? So yeah. how can how can Buller assist with that in terms of a kind of saving money, basically, Mike, is what I'm saying. Like how can you become more efficient and, and spend a bit less cash? Is it possible with Buller? It's well, right now it's Bulla is free right now. So it's absolutely I, oh, possible. <laughs> so, I mean, it's free because I want to get a network. Without a network, nothing works, right? Sure. So, I, I'm happy to, to offer it for free. Some one of my competitors pays, pays the gas even to get their users. Uh, but if you compare uh, traditional systems, it's usually like 3% mm. cost. And mm. especially if you do a wire you know, from here to, let's say, India, I know yeah, your yeah. part, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It costs, and it takes like five days, and who knows if it ever settles, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, cost savings and transparency audits in, in the package included. So it's not like right, you're yeah. going to some, some weird, you know, uh, place next to the bagel store where you can deeply send money you know this is transparent it's on chain <laughs> and, you know we're uh, laughing about it but that's what people have been doing for like 30 years I walking know. into a yellow building and handing their cash <laughs> over to an unknown person send it <laughs> totally. crazy yeah. it, it is crazy and and well and then they get fleeced in the process right i mean that's okay. i think the motivation for el salvador and uh, yeah. those kinds of countries right adopting bitcoin is because they have so many external workers sending money and they've always been, you know, raped and pillaged on the way back. Right. Um, but then ultimately, uh, Bola, how does it make money? Uh, well, the, I, we haven't done the token yet, but we want to, and what it would be is a reward kind of system where let's say you do an invoice, it will cost you, uh, let's say, you know, at most 50 basis points, depending on how big the, the amount is probably free for, you know, nothing, right. We'll have a scale. Um, and, and that money then would accrue to uh, getting more, um, uh, you know, developers um, just for us to continue. It's not, yeah, I don't want to yeah. become uh, JP Morgan, by the way. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be become the, the people that you ran away from, Mike. Like, yes, you know. I don't. I, you know, <laughs> I, I've, I know them well. <laughs> you know them well and you don't want to be part of their gang. I, I'm with you. Like, yeah. if we could digitally high five on that one, I'm doing it right now. So, okay. So let's jump in. So we've talked about 
I think we've covered what Bullet is, what it can do, how it works. And we don't need to jump into the deeper technicalities of it. That's really for the developers to get into. And that's not why we're here. But um, lots of challenges ahead, right, Mike? Lots of challenges in this space. Let's talk about some of the more sort of ones we know about better. We've got the onboarding challenge. And then what I would ask you as well, what do you see as the kind of blockers? I'm a small business. I want to integrate Buller. What would you say would be the biggest blocker for me? And maybe how do you plan to kind of get past this with your with potential customers? A lot of questions there, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the blocker is is not only do you have to be ready to do DeFi, mm -hmm. but so does your counterparty. Yes. Right. And and a lot of times they're they're kind of sort of interested. But I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, I sent a, a payment, not even an invoice, to somebody. Mm -hmm. And and what happens on Bulla is you you send it, and then you can create a little email, and then in the email it arrives and it says your wallet has received such and such X die from this wallet. And if you click on it, it brings up a URL. All of our stuff is URL based. So it will be okay. Bulla network slash, and then a, you know some kind of weird wallet address, mm -hmm. and it will plop you straight into the invoice. But to make that work, you need to have people understand, well, do I have an injected wallet on my browser, right? And, and what I just said, I'll bet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't understand, right? What's an injected wallet? What the hell are you talking about? You know, so so that's the the biggest issue. And we, it was curious because um, I wrote Bull Up because like I said, it's a source of truth and it's only your point of view as to yeah. determine things. So an invoice will show up as a receivable on your end and a, as a payable on my end, right? That's mm -hmm. what I think is really cool about it. But and, and and both sides are automatically taken care of. The moment you enter one, it affects the other, right? Because it's just centralized. Instantly. The problem with that is that so many other people don't are unfamiliar with MetaMask or mm -hmm. Wallet Connect. They don't understand the difference between being on Coinbase and you know being in DeFi land. So that, those are the yeah. hurdles. Those are the biggest hurdles. Okay. So have you got a, a master a master plan to overcome these? I mean, I'm not, I'm seriously, I'm not asking you for, for the master plan, but uh, everybody's got their own ideas on how we can get there. And it's either, sometimes I hear if you can convert entrepreneurs, you can get entrepreneurs to convert their clients and then you get this kind of domino effect. How do you see it? Is it better to go after the large corporations and try and get them to change their business model and then that will trickle down or do it in a grassroots way that goes the other way? What? What do you think? Gosh, it's a tough question. I, <laughs> I right now I'm grassroots uh, because I I don't think change comes from you know people who are fat and happy. I'm um, I was going to agree. Yeah, big time. Right. The the fat yeah. goose isn't that interested in losing weight, right? <laughs> no, but but right. But if if you are an entrepreneur and you want to you know get access to really cheap capital and you like to uh, you know, do some loans or some invoicing or NFTs, you wanna get involved in this space, then I, and, and you see some opportunity, you've got some inventory that you're willing to um, you know, tokenize, so to speak, you wanna get started down that road. I think that's, that's, that's where it's gonna happen. You have to be pretty entrepreneurial and you have to find the other side, like I was saying. And, and so I'm hoping like companies like Centrifuge, you, you mentioned, you sent on your sheet, Mm -hmm. Centrifuge is a very interesting company. They're trying to do that, right? They're trying to build a, like it, it will start with a pool. People saying, okay, I want I want exposure, but I don't know how to get exposure. Tell you what, I'll just give you some money, put you it into it. a pool, and then you do the credit and you do the bulla and you do the, the tokenization. And if the return is, let's say 5%, wow. then, then you're happy, right? I think those kinds of models could get more people exposure but ultimately um big mass adoption is is a ways away I, I i'm afraid yeah i'm with you there like we're not talking about the next couple of years right and we're definitely not talking about like q3 or q4 2022 <laughs> i think in the crypto space i think there's a really big tendency for everything to be moving so fast but <laughs> yeah. then people get this kind of feeling that we're going to just keep going on that trajectory. And I think people don't appreciate how far we have come in the last kind of decade. It's 10 years and it's 
I mean, it's incredible, really, what we've done in such a small space of time. But people are going to have to be a little bit more patient to get to this final hurdle. These hurdles yeah. seem to be the biggest ones. And user onboarding for me is the biggest challenge, I believe. Like, how do you how do you get people to understand? How do you get people to care? But then also, I believe the reason people stick with legacy systems is due to convenience, Mike. But I don't know. Like, we're all creatures of habit, right? Why do we do the things we do? Because they work and they're easy. Web 3's got to get to that point, right? Where you open your phone, it's all very simplistic and easy. Blockchain is all hidden, I, I think. Yeah. Keep that away from the customer. Just make yeah. it efficient and cheap and, and usable, right? Yeah. That's kind of where we're going trying to get to. I mean, we, we do have a mobile version. Yeah, It's a little bit simplified. But again, you have to you know, have a wallet. I mean, a lot of mobile people have Venmo. There's not yep. a lot wrong with Venmo. Venmo is pretty good, actually. I mean, it costs you a lot of money, hmm. but it's convenient. It's easy and it's, it's low risk. You know, you're not going to lose your private key and, and blow up your wallet. So, That's so it. back to the grassroots thing, I, I really hmm. think people who are, who, who want to take advantage of the capital that's out there on the blockchain are going to be the first adopters and Etc. And and back to the other thing, you know, the rate of technology is much faster than the rate of adoption. Much faster. That, you just nailed it in one sentence, Mike. I might steal that from you too, to kind of qu quash people when they say these things. Like the rate of tech is hard, is faster than adoption for sure. Right, right. Our upload. I think Elon said it right. He said our upload speeds are not fast enough. Right? We're not yeah, fast yeah. enough uploading this information. It's all there but we're just taking on taking our slow ass time to kind of uh, digest it all. I think that's pretty logical though. Right? Um, Mike, we're getting to the end of the session. I want to give you, we've, we've spoken about a lot of things and I want to kind of give you the opportunity. Is there anything we haven't spoken about today? Uh, anything perhaps on the roadmap that's coming or is there anything that you just want to get out there about Buller that's uh, important for you today to get across to the audience? Yeah, what's important is, is this is open source. Mm -hmm. I'm a big advocate of open source. I really feel like um, the future of, if, if you're gonna propose a protocol that everybody is going to use with any luck, right? Then it needs to be open source and transparent. And if you're using a system right now that is not like that, you have to understand you are giving up something, right? And, and it could be in the form of a participation, or yeah. better finance down the road, et cetera. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use it now because what we just talked about, rate of adoption, rate of tech. But ultimately, if you are if you want to be truly involved in DeFi, recognize that it, it's about protocols, fat protocols, you know, what they call, right? So like Bulla might make a, a couple of cents on every transaction. So the protocol is, is it, it makes a payment, but that protocol would go to, or that payment would go to then a token that, finances more open source and more, um, you know, access for everybody to, yeah. to get on chain to, you know, improve their lives. So that's really what's very positive to me about web. There are a lot of bad things in the world still, right? But to me, Web3 and DeFi really uh, is targeted at getting everybody uh, access and, yeah. and, and ownership and I and back to Bulla. That's why we're open source. That's why I like DeFi because it's permissionless, it's immutable, it's transparent. And these are all things that the world needs a lot more of. I couldn't agree with you more, especially because we mentioned at the beginning that in the future, you know, the protocol opens up ways for on-chain funding and credit. And I think that's actually something we haven't talked about uh, in gre a great detail, but access to funding <clears throat> is massive in places where perhaps there is no funding. You don't have a credit score. You can't build a credit score because you can't get a credit card in the first place. You can't get on the, the housing ladder because you're not financially capable. You can't You can't even begin with the journey. Like you're basically restricted from day one. But in a system like this, Mike, are we saying that, for example, you and I can transact between each other on a one-to-one -one basis multiple thousands of times and yep. build a credit score based off that, that we are both trustworthy parties? Is that something yes. that we'll see? Yeah. Yes. And, and I think it's, I'm, I'm really excited about friend land. We're probably going to call it Bola land. I'm not sure yet, but okay. the idea is, is, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, society is, is hier hierarchical, let's just say. Right. Yep. And you'll get, you'll have like the, 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 the patriarch has some money and the son-in-law wants to start something. Well, 
right now, why is there a bank involved? Can right. you tell me? You know, and the minute one is, it costs them a lot of money, right? Whereas instead, I make a friend lend. I'm the, you know, I pretend to be the patriarch. I hate being the, I, the, these words I know are, are tinged these days. No, but, it's fine. <laughs> but you know what I, right? But I, I'll, I'll lend you, Ian, you know, a hundred grand. Here's a friend lend. It's a document that both of us have signed. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an IPFS that talks about if we want to arbitrate. Maybe yep. there isn't. Yeah. Right. But that money, then I know I gave to you. It's on chain. It's in my bull of banker. It's in your bull of banker. And now you can start a business. Right. And, and I can even see on your bull of banker, you give me access, yeah. let's yeah. say, to your uh, nose to safe what you're doing with that money. So this this changes the whole uh, uh, dynamic or it, it offers an alternative to uh, a, a lot of the problems with capital formation in in countries where banking systems are, are, you know, embryonic or too expensive for, uh, you know, Chase Manhattan to, to, to go after, right? Exactly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is something that I originally, when I first got into blockchain, maybe six years ago now, we used to talk about this much, much more, actually. And I feel mm -hmm. like we all got it's... a bit distracted. Maybe you and I didn't get distracted, but the, the, the industry seemed to have got distracted by yield farming, monkeys, yep and many other great things that are helping on the evolutionary journey of blockchain, but perhaps not, not doing what we all came here to do, which is what we're talking about here, which is empowering yeah. people with payments. And I think it's quite sad that in the world we live in today, that people are still restricted from those things. And it's criminal. People, and well, and is, think of the human capital, human capital is completely underutilized in the, yeah. in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's outrageous. Uh, not maybe in the United point. States, even in the United States, but in countries like, uh, you know, India, yeah. China, I know has a, you know, restrictive kind of country, but India should have huge, there's so many people there. And yeah. I mean, well, how many, how many uh, 120 IQs are walking around in India that don't have capital? You know? Oh, Mike, you're nailing it. Like you're absolutely nailing it. Like that's so true, isn't it? You've got all these the underappreciation of the human capacity to actually do something great in the world, but without that little booster of finance to begin, they don't stand a chance. So you're basically no. discounting millions of intelligent human beings yes. that could change the world potentially if yes. they just had access to capital. Yes. Wow. And, and, and choose to use a protocol that's transparent and yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing, we're back to our DeFi roots. And what's nice yeah. about the crypto winter is, I, you know, I'm, I'm a survivor, right? I've, I've been through a lot of, you know, SHIT, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm, I'm there. I, I, I know what I'm, why I'm here. I mean, I, I'm here for that reason. I really want to get people to uh, learn about DeFi and use this system to the betterment of, you know, their, their societies. And that's why I got into Solidity. That's back to my, you know, why, Lehman Brothers blew me up. That was my pain experience. And I don't, you know, why, why do we continue with that old system? Not, well, let me just caveat that too. The old system did get us awfully far. I'm not going to say that, you know. It did, it did do, it, let, let's be real. Like they, it's done an immense amount of good, but it's also shown that the human side of things is usually what ruins everything. Yeah. The human yeah. greed <laughs> and the desire for more let's be real right like it's it's usually us that cause the root problem the algorithms didn't do that like it, <laughs> it was it was human nature right and i think we're evolving yes. further and we're trying to get to this place where we can get past it but yeah it will always be there there'll always be an element of people in, in entrenched in that i guess as well but um Super interesting, Mike. I do actually feel like we could sit here and talk all day about this because um, that side of things is super interesting to me. Like that kind of how are we going to make the change? How are we going to get people on board? And and, you're, and what I was going to say was a lot of the time with projects, you know, you hear Buller Network, you hear Buller. People don't really know who you are and, and what you're about. And the reason that I really love to do these sessions is you can go to the Buller website and you can read that information. And it's it's great. But now people can actually understand who's running this show and why they decide to do that and the motivation, you know, not it's not some fickle motivation. It, it's real. And I think yeah. even your journey into things like flipping the script entirely on your life to go and make a change. It's incredible. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. 
And yeah, I think so, um, so next week I'll be running a hedge fund, right? <laughs> 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 That's it. Mike's out. Finished. Had enough. Gone back to the back to the dark side, should we call it? Sorry, so. sorry, guys. <laughs> but let's be real. Let's be real again, Mike. If it wasn't for that, would you be there? I would be. You still would, would be. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably be dabbling in like the pools that we're talking about at Centrifuge. Yeah. But yeah, I'd be you know yeah sharking stuff the usual. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think investment banks do serve a good purpose as well, like we said earlier. But there's also a big, you know, control and uh, right all that stuff. It, it can be a bit, much better system, and I think DeFi will lead the way to that. That's it, right? We just need a bit of a refresh, a bit of a change, a bit of an update to the way we do things because the world has moved forward since they designed these archaic systems, right? And it's about yeah. saving people money and moving us forward as a, as a as the human race as well. So, all right, Mike, last shouts. Where can people connect with Buller? Where's the best place to find out about your current releases? Are you on Twitter, Discord, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook? Where are you guys? Where's best to connect? We are on uh, Twitter, uh, at mm -hmm. Buller Network, all one word. Yeah, and, and then, go, okay. um, yeah, and then on our website, it's bulla.network. And on the on the top header, you can find our Twitter, Discord, uh, you know, links. And uh, yeah. yeah, join the Discord. It's, it's not as lively as I would like. Remember, it's accounting. People are, <laughs> accounting is not the sexiest thing in the world. So, you know, don't expect too, too many fireworks there, but but if you need help, if you need support, we're really gung ho on giving people support. Um, that's our first uh, two bigger clients are always on the support. You can also, it's great to see their questions because that will, yeah. uh, you know, help you to yep. get started and do stuff. Okay, cool. So if you're an entrepreneur or you're looking to reach out and find out about more information on this, then the Discord is a good place to head to. As Mike says, there's already questions been answered. It will feed your curiosity, I'm sure, at the beginning. And then, uh, yeah, reach out to these guys and have a chat. And uh, that's where everything starts, right? Starts with a chat. All right. So we've come to the end of the session, Mike. I just really want to thank you. It's been a really good chat today. I um, think you've done an amazing job of outlining what Buller is all about, why it exists and the problems you're trying to solve. I think that's uh, you've done a great job of doing that, man. So <laughs> and most importantly, why it's beneficial for, for Buller and why it's beneficial for Fuse as well from the Fuse side. Yeah. We're, we're delighted that Buller's launched because now the developer, developer community have got access to more tools, to more tooling that they need to build the, the infrastructure for Web3 payments. So yeah, I, I added good good dollar as a as a ERC twenty. You can invoice in good dollar if you want. So nice. Okay, very cool. See, there and these go. are the types of projects that we sort of nurture on Fuse. Absolutely, it's not you know you don't find your fifty forks of Uniswap on Fuse. You're finding real world pro <laughs> <laughs> real world projects with real world application that are trying to really make a difference here. So we would encourage everyone to go and check out our DApps and and just dive into Fuse. See what you think. Yeah. But that's it for us today, Mike. Thank you so much, sir. You've been a great guest. Um, I wish you an amazing rest of your day and the rest of your weekend. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll catch up soon, man. Like maybe when you've uh, taken over the world and everyone's using bullet invoices. Yeah. We'll, we'll come and have I'll come by Lithuania. Next Friday, go. right? You'll have it done by then. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. All right, guys. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a great weekend. Take care. Much love.